continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. There's no democratic or republican way of cleaning the streets, or I should add, of recovering cities after hurricanes or tropical storms. These are the venerable words of three-term New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, the first part, not my ad lib, who, like his Empire State brethren, Senator Pothole Al D'Amato, would take great care in delivering the service in public service. And it's in that pragmatic, can-do spirit we've recently welcomed mayors here on The Open Mind, from the states of Pennsylvania and Indiana, and today from the bellwether of Ohio, whose electoral votes are crucial to any presidential candidate's prospects. Nan Whaley, candidate for governor of Ohio, is mayor of Dayton, a leader in affordable housing in the state, and also a hub of manufacturing. Mayor Whaley is focused on a citywide effort to ensure that her neighborhoods are not merely served with functioning bridges, and roadways, but high quality schooling, mentorship, and employment. Mayor, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks, Alexander. Glad to be here. One of the th issues that seems to be a source of consensus rather than contention is the opioid mm -hmm. epidemic, which is touching communities affluent, impoverished alike. You've had hands on experience with that, rallying Democrats and Republicans in what ought to be a public service, which is taking care of people's health. Right. I mean, I think what we saw a bit definitely in southern Ohio and places in like Western West Virginia, it hit our uh, cities and communities first, and we're seeing it really hit all across the country. Uh, and recognizing uh, what impact it can have to neighbors, uh, family members, friends, uh, when it does happen. What's really interesting about this epidemic is it uh, really affects everyone. And in the past, I think we've had um, drug, drug epidemics that have happened just to one certain sector of the population or one economic class. And we see in this, uh, with the heroin epidemic, that it's, it's affecting every, every, every sector of our community. How have you addressed it in your city? Well, you know, in, t in 2014, I was elected mayor. I was sworn in as mayor, and I was um, declared, I was one of the first cities in the state to declare a state of emergency. We really needed to make sure that we owned this issue and started really working on it uh, in a hands-on way. Uh, this past month, or actually a couple months ago, uh, we uh, were the first city in the state of Ohio to sue uh, pharmaceutical companies, the manufacturers, the distributors, and some of the doctors that started this mess. If you go back, uh, you can see that most people started getting addicted to opioids actually with prescription painkillers. And um, the painkillers started because do uh, doctors were told by the big drug companies that this was not addictive. It certainly is an addictive source. And once those pills went away, heroin stepped in. And now we're even seeing fentanyl and carfentanil stepping in into that, into that um, space. And it's ripping apart our communities and our um, families and our friends. And um, you know, I think that opening of uh, telling folks that uh, pain painkillers were not addictive is the big problem that started this whole mess. How are you taking an issue like that and responding to it with a constructive political outcome? And why can't other issues be like that? Well, I think because, again, you know, our, our communities and our country have a tendency to be so sectored, and uh, heroin has now been the thing that affects everyone. I think that's a real key point. There's a silver lining in it, for sure, because there's an opportunity 
for us to really get addiction service and mental health services right. Um, I think that's one of the, the um, efforts that we have really not done well this last half century on mental health and addiction and having an understanding of the disorder and disease that it is. And because it's affecting everyone, we have a great opportunity here. And people ask me a lot of time, you know, what does success look like in this effort? And, you know, I say, like, we have an opportunity to really get our addiction services correct. Uh, the, the mayors are on the front line across the state of Ohio on this. Um, we've seen cities after Dayton also uh, sue the co drug companies like Parma, Lorraine, Cincinnati, uh, even counties in southern Ohio that are holding the drug companies accountable, which is a key part. But also we sent a letter to the governor's office to say, hey, here are the seven things we need the state to do too. Uh, and one of the frustrations we're having both from both state and federal government is getting lots of talk and very little action. And so that's, that's I think, a, a, a gaining drumbeat that we're seeing uh, across mayors across the country, frankly. And what is the objective that you seek from these companies? Uh, from the companies, I want them, this is about justice for taxpayers and justice for the families that have been hurt by them opening a market they knew was addictive. So, you know, we're seeking justice from the pharmaceutical companies. From our, um, our colleagues in state and federal government, we want them to, de to, to treat it like the, the um, emergency that it is. We want them to de not only declare it as a national emergency, but we want them then to take action. And the mayors across the state and country have very specific, we have very specific things we, can, we think that can be helpful in that. Now this is an issue where there appears to be agreement among Democrats and Republicans about the need for government intervention. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to me in the wake of these most recent storms that the FEMA director was alluding to people signing up who wanted to seek uh, assistance and that it was important that they state what their insurance is. And I thought to myself, does everybody have insurance? No. No, that's the challenge. I mean, an emergency and a disaster is an emergency and a disaster. And we can't be saying, well, you weren't really prepared, and so too bad for you. And I think that's the challenge we have. Is that a philosophical disagreement in your gubernatorial race that you are going to hone for the working Americans to underscore the difference between perhaps an administration that wants to relieve only the underlying symptom but not the disease of economic distress yeah i think absolutely for us in the governor's race it's, it's a couple of things we think we need a governor that you know gets the uh, issues that are affecting people right and nobody but mayors in government really get that right we're the ones like you like you began are on the front lines, understand what's happening to communities, understand what's happening to our neighbors, because we don't have the luxury of looking away from those issues. So I think that that practical uh, spirit and pragmatic effort that mayors have is definitely something we bring to the governor's race. And then secondly, uh, I don't think that it's the role of government to say, well, you didn't, you didn't do everything exactly right, so now you're in this crisis, we can't help you out. And so I think that's a, a big difference. You know, there needs to be some compassion in these efforts for sure. You know, when, when our, uh, in Dayton, for example, during the, um, during the uh, hurricanes, you know, we had folks, you know, going down to Texas. We have folks that are trying to rescue folks. We have people that are donating toiletries or dollars, and they're not putting on a restriction, well, only if you have flood insurance are you going to be able to get this toilet paper. I mean, that's just really ridiculous. And so I think that's part of the challenge of the federal government is having right now. Was there too much of an emphasis on volunteerism, which was negating or minimizing the necessity of government to assist and to continue to assist these people, how do you assess the government's role in an emergency situation and not an emergency situation to provide a standard of living? And is there a standard of living that is adequate in Ohio right now? Well, that's a really big question, Alexander. I think... Um, I'll give you time. Take as much <laughs> right. time as I, you want. I think, I think, you know, when emergencies are declared, 
that is when government steps in to get people back to their normal and to be as helpful as possible so that they don't die, that they're taken care of and they can get back to, to um, you know, productive you know, work again, right? So I think on the national emergency piece, uh, and you know, look, we've asked, you know, for the federal government to declare a national emergency on opioids because we see the hollowing out that it's had um, in our community. So, you know, from the opioid addiction issue to hurricanes and natural disasters, there's a place for the federal government to play for sure, and definitely the state government uh, to participate in. Because, you know, uh, local communities uh, can't withhold, you know, a hurricane or you know disasters like the opioid epidemic, right? So, and, and it's, it's not from fault of those communities that this happened. So, I definitely think there. For us in Ohio, uh, you know, we have ha gone through a tremendous uh, reshift through the Great Recession, right? And the Midwest is not the same as it was before uh, 2009. And I think what you're seeing is a really healthy conversation of. What does it mean um, to, to live in these communities? Uh, the question about the dignity of work. Uh, what is the value of work, which I believe is a fundamental part of uh, the American experience. Uh, and, you know, the belief of working hard uh, should, should elicit a decent and fair pay. Uh, I, think, I think right now we're in a conversation about um, more about the scarcity of resources or the scarcity of your, your experience rather than whether you're willing to work hard. And both should be important to um, the American ideas. And I think that's a hard question for people to get around, right? Uh, we have people that um, countless, I know countless folks in Dayton and across the country and across the state that had, uh, have, you know, worked hard, have uh, played by the rules, have, you know, provided for their families, and now all of a sudden because the economy has drastically changed and the economy changes faster than, quite frankly, our heads can get around it, uh, they're left out in the cold. And I don't think that's fair, and I think that's something that both our state and federal government have to be um, working on. And to just say, too bad, you're out of luck, the cards weren't in your favor, I don't think that's an acceptable answer to Ohioans or Americans. What is distinctive about Ohioans? Well, I think Ohioans, you know, have been the people that have fed and built this country. Uh, you know, uh, most people don't realize they think of our cities a lot of times. You, they either think about our cities like Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, Akron, and Toledo as um, these heavy manufacturing uh, places that have built this country and, you know, have, you know, created the crossroads that people get th through the country to as well. But also, you know, we also are the ones that lead on agriculture, on feeding this country. So um, the heartland is really an uh, appropriate uh, view of Ohio. I think the other thing people need to realize about Ohio is it's, it's really a pretty diverse place, right? Um, it's almost like five states in one with five different personalities. And again, I think that's why mayors and local control is so key in Ohio because what may work in uh, Mingo Junction, Ohio, doesn't work in Toledo. And we have to allow those local um, leaders and those local communities to really do what's best for their, their city and, and, their, and their areas. Specifically in your state, what are the systemic failures or dysfunctions that you would like to wipe out in successfully improving the economy such that working folks are happy and, and can earn a decent living and can fulfill their God-given potential. Right. I mean, I think what we've seen, you know, in the past um, 25, 30 years in manufacturing is the automation of the manufacturing. And to this date, until manufacturing became automated, any sort of technology actually resorted in more jobs. But that hasn't really been the case in manufacturing. Uh, an example is uh, today there, uh, there is the golden era of manufacturing right now. We're producing more in Ohio and Michigan than we've really ever produced before with significantly less workers. Uh, one in five robots in the country are in Ohio and Michigan. So the automation of manufacturing has really changed how we 
um, produce efforts and we are seeing less people working because of that, right? And that's been a real difference. Before, any sort of technology had always recreated more jobs, but we're seeing that change. And we'll, I think we'll see that more as we talk about artificial intelligence and the automation of logistics, right? The same thing. And the, the, the tail for manufacturing was around 50 years. The tail for automation in logistics is probably 25 and we're probably in year four or five of that as we see these self-driving cars and trucks. Ohio is num also number one in truck drivers in the country, obviously, because everything is connected. You have to get through Ohio to get really anywhere in the country. Uh, and so this is a very important time for um, uh, our government, for our um, think tanks, for our universities to really define and work on the dignity of work. And what does it mean to have a job? And should everyone really have the opportunity to have a job? And I think that's the big question that's coming forward that really needs to be digged, on, digged into in the political sense, not just for Ohio, but really for the, the rest of the country and what that means for us. Now, I come you know, from a place where, you know, again, um, uh, the value to my family and the, v the value to our community is like you work hard and play by the rules, you, you will win in the end. And we're not seeing that happen so anymore. So what, when I asked you that though, I'm, I'm really asking about internal institutions like your state house. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think there's a lot of efforts that they need, they could do more of. You know, right now the, the minimum wage is unlivable, right? Right now, um, we expect um, uh, families just to figure out how to take care of kids, you know, even though they need two incomes. So there's big opportunities to really transform how we think of work and, and how we provide for families in a way that could be much better for both the families to, to be able to be uh, succinct and then also for their communities. Uh, Dayton, for example, was the first city in the state to provide paid parental leave because again, we know if, uh, if our workers go and have that opportunity with their children and bond with their children, have that time, they're better workers and they wanna stay longer working for our, for our city. Those kind of efforts are really important about how we think about family and how we think about our community. If you really think about what we've done over the past 50 years, we haven't done much to change what, um, what a two family working system is like, what even like a single parent, and we, and we basically tell families to figure it out. And I think that's the challenge that we have overall of keeping people in the workforce, but then also the key part of making people have, making sure people have opportunities to work. And the, the whole idea, which I think was a failed notion, is that um, folks could just automatically be retrained, uh, just doesn't work. And so there's some retraining that can happen, but there's almost like a two generation discussion, right? We have to make sure that our young people are educated and, and recognize that the, the world that they'll live in in 20 years is different than the world that you and I are even living in. And so how do we make sure that they have the critical thinking skills and the ability to be really educated for that next uh, world? And then also we have to celebrate and recognize the dignity of work for the people that have done that work to make sure that Ohio has been uh, a great place to be. And those two generational conversations, I think, is really what is going on right now in national and, local, and, uh, and statewide politics. Your current governor, John Kasich, mm -hmm. what did he do right? What did he get wrong? So I like to say, you know, that Governor Kasich has done one thing right and about 99 things wrong. And so he gets a lot of credit for the one thing, and that is Medicaid expansion. Uh, the ability for us to have Medicaid in our state has been very helpful, particularly on the opioid ad addiction issue, right? Uh, most all of our services for uh, dealing with uh, those that are addicted is through Medicaid, right? So if Medicaid would go away in Ohio, it would affect our ability to provide ambulance service, uh, the emergency service that goes along, treatment, recovery. Uh, Medicaid has been clear on that. And Governor Kasich's protection of that has been, um, should be, and has been applauded. Uh, the, the wrong part is the fact that for um, uh, the past 50 some months, we have been trailing job numbers uh, compared to national numbers. And if you consider how far down Ohio was in the Great Recession and how tough the Great Recession was for Ohio, we should be beating those national job numbers because of the hole we were in. 
Uh, his uh, tax policy has been more regressive than Kansas. They have actually taking, uh, taken uh, loopholes away in Kansas that we still have in place in Ohio with this idea that if we don't tax uh, uh, the wealthy that suddenly the poor and middle class and working folks will be all right. And again, Alexander, if that worked, I would be all for it, but we have 15 years of this continual cuts and especially the past eight years with Governor Kasich where it has not worked. We do not have more jobs than we did before. And again, these tax policies have consequences on job growth. And I think that's been the part that he is, most people across the nation have paid very little attention to in Ohio. You know, if you have 56 straight months of below average job numbers in Ohio, that's where the frustration's coming from. One thing though that you, we didn't mention from the national perspective is what is perceived as a more civil approach than the national presidential voice. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to folks in Ohio, they'll tell you Governor Kasich can get quite fiery. Yeah, and <laughs> there's the Ohio Kasich and then there's the right, national Kasich. Right. right, right. So, but he did lead by example in providing an alternative voice and I wonder, are you at all fearful that the kind of rhetoric that is employed by the White House now could be employed by governors in your state and other states? Look, I think, uh, I think it's a low bar if you're a Republican right now, right? So if you um, um, are kind to one person, suddenly you're a statesman because of the Republican president right now. So I think... I think that is something that's not hard to step over as a Republican um, by being. But uh, then again, at the same time, Ohio is a state that voted for. Right, right. And I think President there's, Trump. I think there's definitely again there's anger in Ohio, uh, and I think that uh, the president tapped into that for all the reasons we've been discussing before. Right, you know, folks worked hard, play the, by the rules, and they're not getting ahead. Uh, and that's really it. So it's not about uh, statesmanlike or not. They want some some sort of action uh, uh, for Kasich himself and for um, the state of politics. Yeah, I worry about that, right? Because I want to have a discourse of ideas, a discourse of you know, hey, I disagree with John Kasich on how he's governed the state because of the effects, effects it's had on communities and people. And I don't think that people are better off than before he came. Um, so you're the candidate, but you, I want you to be the strategist too, because the, any good candidate ought, ought to be a strategist. What is your principal challenge in conveying the argument about taxation that the governor's approach was unsuccessful and that you'll have a superior approach? Well, I don't. I think I think people are hungry for that message. Frankly, when you talk about the fact that Kansas, who is considered the most regressive, Sam Brownback, it's just been interesting to watch the national conversation about Sam Brownback versus John Kasich, who John Kasich actually has a more um, regressive, oppressive tax policy than Brownback now in his state policy, but doesn't get much coverage. And the fact that they're not better off with this policy, right? People in Ohio know their communities over the past decade haven't improved, that the job numbers are, are bad. They're the worst since 2009. I think you saw that in 2016, and that's the conversation we're going to continue to have in 2018 because I think there is, it's not necessarily a partisan discussion. It's a discussion, again, a pragmatic discussion about how we can move our state forward and get back to the ground about what these communities and what, what these families need. So what will be the gravest challenge in this campaign that you've launched? Oh, I mean, it's, it's expensive. I think that's something that's been hard for us. Watching the unlimited access to money in campaigns is not something that we're excited about. Uh, I think the other thing is it's, it's a big state as I mentioned, it's about five states in one. And so, uh, you know, getting to know people and uh, having conversations uh, is something that we really like to do. Uh, and that's hard to do on a state as big of a, as Ohio. So, you know, uh, we, we tease that if I get to meet everybody in their living room and get to talk to folks, we think we, you know, definitely share a message that people, uh, people believe in. But getting to everybody is going to be the biggest challenge. Do you take inspiration from your 
Ohioan or your Midwestern forebearers of political figures who came of age in the Midwest and championed a message of forward-thinking policy? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, my favorite governor is actually uh, Jim Cox, and most people don't know him, but he started Cox Media, and it came from the Dayton Daily News. Uh, he was a governor actually from Dayton. He's the last governor that came from Dayton. Uh, he, to date. To date. It was like 1914. So, right, exactly. So, you know, maybe a hundred and some years later we can get... Uh, or maybe uh, a few years later. Right, no, but from 1914, <laughs> right? right? Uh, and uh, Governor Cox uh, uh, really was the workers' uh, governor, uh, instituted workers' compensation in the state of Ohio, made sure that workers that got hurt on the job had opportunities to be able to pay when they had to, you know, uh, go off of that, that workforce. That's been a key part of who Governor Cox is, a real progressive in workers' issues, something that obviously, as you can tell from this conversation, is important to me. And this was pre-New Deal. Yeah, so one interesting part. Governor Cox ran for president. Uh, as the Democrat nominee, uh, his vice president candidate was um, Franklin, Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt right. Yeah, and uh, so before the New Deal, and and he ran against a man named Warren Harding, who was the Republican nominee, and he also was from Ohio. Could you imagine that uh, today, uh, having two candidates running for president, Democrat and Republican nominee, both from the state of Ohio? Mayor, I don't want you to be afraid of grounding your work as mayor, as a candidate in history, because in those few minutes, which you're welcome to elaborate on in the seconds now we have remaining, you lit up and I think you'd light up a living room or a town <laughs> hall or an auditorium because that history is so critical. Yeah, it's important. Uh, I, think, I think the history of Ohio and where Ohio has been is important, but I also think its future is really key too. And, you know, when I'm thinking about what we're going to do for Ohio and what we're going to do for cities like Dayton, uh, look, we need partners in the state house, and we need partners that care about issues affecting um, families and workers. And that's really what pushed me into this race, and I think that our message is resonating with Ohio voters. Well, I think it's thanks to the influence of Governor Cox that you had a President Roosevelt for four terms. That's right that the nation remembers as the workman's or workwoman's president. Right, so that progressive era we need to get back to on that. Mayor, thank you for your time today. Thanks, Alexander. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.